everyone. Welcome to another exceedingly exciting Stan Energy Man here. Stan Osterman coming to you live and direct from Kailua, Hawaii, uh, here in the beautiful Aloha State, kind of quiet Aloha State right now with all the airplanes kind of harbored up. But, uh, you know, we're, we're doing okay out here in the middle of the Pacific, and uh, I think we'll, we'll get through this coronavirus thing okay. Um, but we miss all the tourists and we, we'd love to have some of you come, come out and start visiting us as we open up. Today's show is uh, kind of an extension of a show we did about a, two months ago with a gentleman uh, named Andy Marsh. And he's the president and CEO of a company called Plug Power, which isn't exactly a um, household name that you'd know right now, but uh, it will be. So you might as well get used to it. It's uh, I'm certain it's going to be on the lips of a whole lot of people over the next few years. And uh, and Andy, uh, it's great to have you on the show again. I always enjoy talking to you. And you know, you're the you're the person that I know best um, for having the contacts at the very uh, center of industry when it comes to hydrogen. You're on the hydrogen council. You're um, you're probably I would say arguably the most successful hydrogen corporation in the U.S. for sure, probably in the world, um, that focuses exclusively on hydrogen equipment. So I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today and talk a little bit. Could you could you start off by giving us a little bit of an update of uh, what you've been up to the last couple of months since we last talked? Sure. Hey, Stan, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I wish I was in Hawaii. We're expecting snow on Friday here in upstate New York. So uh, a lot of your listeners, I'm sure, are local. And uh, boy, are they lucky. But uh, <laughs> well, I have been, to just, uh, you just have to take a corona test 72 hours before you get here, and you're good to go. That, that sounds good, Stan. I, that sound, I may be on my way soon. Okay. But uh, <laughs> hey. So it's been exciting since we last talked. We had a huge investor day at the end of September called the Plug Power Symposium. And I think the last time we talked, we talked a great deal about green hydrogen and Plug Power's effort to move into green hydrogen. We bought an electrolyzer company, which as you know, takes renewable electricity, creates hydrogen and gases form. And we bought the only company that ever built a private large-scale hydrogen facility that's able to liquefy hydrogen and send it around. So uh, last time we talked though, and uh, you know, during, that t during the symposium, we talked about we just signed agreements with Brookfield, uh, which is a $500 billion asset owner of items like solar plants and wind and APEX to provide us the renewable electricity to feed our future green hydrogen plants. And we'll have five of them, which generate 100 tons a day. So it's really exciting, uh, but we need things to power. And part of that was an announcement that uh, we made that uh, we'll be powering regional aircraft. Uh, probably could be used to fly from Maui to Honolulu. And, uh, <laughs> And when, I, when we, we made the announcement, it's with a company called Universal Hydrogen, and it's led by the old CTO of uh, Airbus. And they've come up with an exciting platform how you can convert all regional planes into hydrogen power regional planes. Wow, that would be awesome. So when you say regional planes, that's up to how many passengers? So about to 50 passengers. Uh, okay. And so uh, if you if you think about it, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, what I really like about universal hydrogen is they're incredibly practical. That, uh, you know, we built this business a plug by being practical. And Paul came up with this idea about, hey, it's going to be tough to have lots of hydrogen infrastructure at their airport. So let's bring hydrogen as an, in as a container. And you actually just take that container on and off the plane. And that container actually feeds hydrogen into the fuel cell, which is, in the, which is located in the, in the nacella. And then there are the electric motors there. And that really provides the propulsion. 
and it's at a weight that's equivalent to the present weight of regional aircraft. And we'll actually be doing first flights in 2024. So it's uh, really exciting, Stan. Well, that's, that's really interesting because, you know, in airplanes, you have to balance them out all the time. And yeah. if your fuel is in a module that you just basically insert into the same weight and balance point, that, that makes your calculations a lot easier. And it also probably is a lot safer because you can lock it down really tight and um, probably doesn't slosh around as much as fuel would. It's much yeah. lighter. So that, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. He yeah. does and, have a good and, concept there. Yeah, and Stan, um, so it's about 1.5 megawatts of fuel cell. Wow. What, what's really interesting is the fuel cell module is the same modules that we use for on-road vehicles and for large-scale backup power systems. So it's using kind of standard, everything about it is how do you use standard building blocks to actually move into the aviation industry. And to me, it's just such a, you know, instead of, uh, you know, how do you get between now and 2035? And this is really an ideal way to move into electrification of airplanes today, not sometime long into the future. Well, I think that's the key. You know, in this election, we're talking a lot about fracking and fossil fuels and stuff. But the idea is you don't get rid of all that and then come up with a replacement. What you do is you start building the replacement and putting it in play and, and eventually phase out the old technology to bring in the new technology and get your infrastructure built up and things like that in a, in a you know, the way the plug power did it in an incremental, very deliberate, very structured way. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, we're talking about aircraft here today, but this morning I was with a, uh, a large power producer where they're looking to move a portion of the energy that goes into their turbines into green hydrogen. So the turbines may have a mix of 15 to 20% hydrogen to burn, which makes them considerably greener and uh, you know helps them reduce their carbon footprint in a rational, logical way. And I think that whole concept, I think you're right on the money, Stan, how you have that evolution from fossil fuel to a totally clean economy, you know, you have to think through how you use the present infrastructure on that journey. And uh, I think what we're doing here with the folks at Universal Hydrogen is the same concept of, you know, you're not going to throw away an aircraft that's been built. Yeah. There's exactly. that, that asset's valuable. Uh, but look, you, as you know, the engines have to be changed occasionally. And there comes points of times where you have to change it out. And there'll be perfect time to make that transition. And that's, you know, those kind of ideas is what gets me excited. So you're exactly right, Andy. And especially in the aviation world, um, we don't just, you know, throw airplanes off to the side after a couple of years. The uh, KC-135 that I flew right before I left the Air Force had already exceeded the age of the, all the pilots that were flying <laughs> it. So you get on the flight deck and there's a crew of, you know, 20 and 30 year old kids flying the airplane at 60 years old. Um, and it all has to do with the type of maintenance you do in the aviation mm -hmm. world. Um, they call it time compliance, inspections and replacements. Even if a part's not broken, at a certain point in time or flying hours or cycles, you always take it out and change it, whether it's worn or not. And that's how you keep those airplanes flying and do it safely. Um, and certainly airplanes aren't made to last just 10 years. They're, they're made to last quite a bit longer. The KC-135s and the B-52s that the Air Force flies, they were made in the 1950s and 60s. And uh, that's, that's a pretty amazing feat, especially considering how the military is not exactly the most gentle user of airframes <laughs> in, in the world. That, you know, Stan, I think people don't recognize all the time how long infrastructure lasts. You know, I did a design, I, I was an electrical designer when I was younger, and I did a design for undersea cable, which uh, power repeaters 
and that power supply is actually still used today. You know, I hate to say this, 45 years later. So that's kind of, uh, so you're right. So when you're thinking about, and even when you think about our main business that we started with, you now going into forklift trucks, we don't change the forklift truck. We change the battery and put a fuel cell in there when the battery run, run, ends, comes to end of life. And that's really how I think people have to think about this transition, uh, be it planes, be it large scale turbines, be it vehicles, what does that transition look like and how do you leverage the infrastructure that exists today? Well, I'd say the, the success of long lasting infrastructure is good design to begin with. And, you know, I'd say that's a credit to your uh, skills as an early electrical designer <laughs> to come up with that technology, but that's really important. And I'll say for Boeing, the KC-135 and the um, B-52 are two great examples of an airplane that was designed from scratch to be good and strong and uh, last through the cycles that airplanes fly through, the metal fatigue issues. Uh, and he, the KC-135 was upgraded to basically twice the power in the engines that it was designed for originally. And the airplane is still flying, um, but right. they had to do some serious modifications to the airframe to make it so it was structurally sound enough to do that. But it all starts with good design. And, and I think that's critical. You know, so as we look forward, you know, we both look at um, mostly, in your case, uh, material handling equipment and vehicles. But as we start to look at hydrogen on infrastructure in grids, and my, my favorite example is on an off-the-grid home. If you had a, a excess solar power and you could turn it into hydrogen, you could be cooking with hydrogen, you could be running your car off the hydrogen, you know, how do you think that transition is going to play out? You know, I actually think, Stan, you'll, and you'll, you're beginning to see this in Japan, that uh, eventually there be, will be hydrogen pipelines very similar uh, to uh, natural gas pipelines. You probably don't have a lot of natural gas in uh, Hawaii would be my guess to home. Is that oh, correct? We, uh, here on Oahu, we actually have over a thousand miles of uh, pipelines. Really? 125 miles of high pressure and over a thousand miles of low pressure. I did not know that. That's kind of cool. So uh, when you think about the natural gas pipeline today, take somebody like National Grid. So National Grid, which is a huge utility uh, we actually have them in New York, but they're really UK based. They're looking to take their natural gas pipeline and convert it completely to hydrogen by 2040. So, uh, you know, you'll start by injecting a small amount of hydrogen, but eventually what they'll do is they'll use large scale wind power off the North Sea, create the electrolyzers hydrogen and just put that into the pipeline. And so you're taking advantage of electricity at low cost, because as you know, I'm sure you have this issue in Hawaii, that uh, there's lots of stranded renewables uh, where it's not used. And what's the best thing to do with that stranded renewable? Is creating the hydrogen. So, uh, you know, it's another example. How do you take established infrastructure and turn it into uh, something that's clean and usable in the modern world. I, you know, I'll give you another example, Stan. We're looking at, uh, I mentioned to you, we're looking to build five hydrogen plants over the next four years. Many of the places we're looking to do that as, believe it or not, it's old coal plants, coal power plants, because you have all the electrical infrastructure there for distribution and feeding the plants. And that energy that once was used to feed coal power plants uh, can be used uh, actually to provide uh, power to electrolyzers. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's ways, you know, there's ways you have to always be thinking about what exists and what you can do cost effectively. And with aircraft, it's the same item. But you know what else I really like about aircraft? Uh, you've flown on those regional airline crafts, right? 
they're miserable rides. I, I, that's what we have up in Albany. So I'm bouncing all around the plane. You know, when you start as you, when you start putting electric motors in there, you know, instead of having that jerky flight that's so uncomfortable, electric motors will actually give you a nice smooth ride without, you know, without, you know, from a passenger point of view. So you're getting not only the environmental benefits, you're actually providing passengers a better product. And as we talk about, you know, you have to think about infrastructure, but you also have to think about you have to add additional value to customers to help make this transition faster and quicker. And that's really what uh, we think about when we make an offering for fuel cells. How can make our customers' life easier? And in this aircraft world with universal hydrogen, in reality, that's what they're doing too. Yeah, it's all about the customer in the end when you're in, when you're in the public service business like you guys are. Yeah. Well, Andy, we're going to take a quick break here. We'll be back in 60 seconds, and uh, we're going to talk some more about pipelines and, uh, and infrastructure Sounds and aviation. Great. And aviation. Sounds good, Stan. Welcome back to Stan Awesome here and Stan Energy Man show with my one of my very favorite guests, Mr. Andy Marsh of Plug Power. And we've been talking about um, how we actually make that transition um, to a cleaner environment and cleaner energy um, via hydrogen and even cleaner aviation. So we were talking a little bit about pipelines. And what I talked to Andy about during the break is what we've discovered is those pipelines are important, not just for the actual pipes themselves, but also for the easements, because uh, in many cases, the gas companies have easements that are approved by the government. And <clears throat> getting those easements is not easy. It involves a lot of lawyers and a lot of money, and they already exist, and some of them are becoming obsolete. So moving things through a pipeline is a whole lot cheaper than moving them in big trucks and moving them on highways and railways. So if we can capitalize off of that, that'll really help us out. What do you, what do you think, Andy? Oh, I, I think, I, I know there's a project that we're working on in the, in the Netherlands uh, where they're looking to use renewable electricity, create hydrogen and move it through pipelines. And it's about seven or eight times the lower cost to transport the hydrogen via pipeline than transmitting the hydrogen via you know, trucks. So it is, it is a, uh, I would call it a game changer, Stan. That's, uh, again, it's another big driver, how you reduce the cost of hydrogen and also how you make hydrogen a more ubiquitous fuel, right? You know, that's one of, you know, one of the challenges this industry's always had is how do you make hydrogen easy? And, you know, we talked about this concept for aviation where you just, and we talked about earlier, how you load it and unload it onto the plane that makes it easy. And so us in the hydrogen industry, you know, you can talk about all the new technology all you want, but you really have to think about how you make that experience simple. And one of the uh, drawbacks and challenges for the industry has always been infrastructure. And the work that you were talking about in New Mexico, about how to use the pipeline, you know, putting hydrogen in 
containers and putting it on planes. That kind of work just makes it so much easier to have hydrogen is readily available. Because once you move to electrification, once you use the hydrogen, so many things become simpler. Just think about the automatic guided vehicles and electrification. And you know, fuel cell uh, vehicles, which are uh, powered by hydrogen, you know, because they're electric, you can do just so many more things with electric devices than you can do with old mechanical devices. And so from just data generation, data knowledge and maintenance and how you make sure it's safer for people, all that comes into play when you move into electrification because you just get so much more data. So, you know, I think people get, forget about uh, all the advantages of electrification and all the advantages that hydrogen and all the applications hydrogen can enable uh, if it becomes readily available. And Stan, as you mentioned, pipelines is one of the ways to do that. Yeah, I was even amazed to find out that they're considering hydrogen fuel cells and things like cell phones and um, and small appliances. And that kind of boggled my mind because I, I see it kind of like you do as more of an industrial transportation, kind of on a larger scale. It's hard for me to miniaturize a fuel cell and things down to a cell phone or small appliances, but uh, it's happening. Yeah, I, I, I probably... I probably think that's probably not the best application. I actually have a little electrolyzer that sits on my desk, which provides cell phone backup power to me from my cell phone. So I actually use devices like that, but I would say that uh, it's probably not the perfect application. You know, when I think about the, um, you know, the whole clean energy spectrum and how you power devices, I think there's places where batteries are perfect, right? Uh, cell phones are a perfect example. I think vehicles that have to travel less than 100 miles, I think you know, batteries solve many, many storage, which is four to six hours. Then if you have assets that really have to be used heavily, that's really where fuel cell and hydrogen fit in perfect. And uh, that's everywhere from forklift trucks to long range transportation to ferries to railroads, all those kind of items, hydrogen makes sense. And then I think there's another class, Stan, and you know, I think international transportation for airlines, for example, I think biofuels are the right answer just because of their energy density and weight. So, I mean, I think that uh, the future clean energy world has to be a mixture of all those technologies uh, to be uh, to really be able to meet the carbon goals set out by the Paris Accord. Yeah. <clears throat> Here in Hawaii, we have a saying that um, there's no sil silver bullet to the energy, um, you know, defossilization of our energy grid. It's a silver buckshot. There's got to be yeah. a lot of different. <laughs> Uh, now, do you have deer in Hawaii? Still? Yes, we do. We have Axis deer, and we have, um, I believe, black-tailed deer on Kauai. Only one island has black-tailed deer. Several islands, Maui, Lanai, and Molokai, Maui County essentially has Axis yeah. deer. Yeah, we. Now, now we, I should, we. I don't want to divert too much, but are those deer native, or were they imported? <clears throat> They're all imported. They were usually gifts to the royalty here. Okay. Interesting. Oh yeah, we could get into a whole cultural thing on cowboys <laughs> and cattle and deer and, and birds and everything. But uh, yeah. you know, another an, an interesting story that we have here. You know, we we worked a lot with the military, and we were at a conference one time where a Navy special ops guy got up and said, "Hey, you know, it's it's kind of a tough problem if any can help us solve it, but our our Navy SEALs." They can't take lithium batteries on the submarines because they're they have thermal thermal runaway issues and stuff. So we have a, a limitations there. And after so after he finished talking and, and on a break, I, I went up to him and I said, Well, do you know that on your nuclear submarines you, you have the capacity to make oxygen, right? And he said, oh, Yeah. I go, you know what you throw away? And he goes, No. I go, you throw away the hydrogen. And 
you could be using metal hydride little cells in places of batteries and you could be charging those with the hydrogen you, that you already make on your submarine and if you know anything at all about getting anything on a navy ship especially a navy nuclear ship it takes incredible amount of science and study and testing and proving to make sure it's safe enough and it was a real surprise to the guy and i know now that the navy is actually working on that stuff because yeah. it, it it solved a problem for him so hydrogen yeah. does solve some unique problems so stan we have a you know, we made an acquisition of an electrolyzer company that did lots of work with NASA, have been developing electrolyzers for 47 years. And one of the products actually runs the electrolyzer uh, for uh, uh, satellites going one direction. And so, you know, it creates hydrogen, uh, but when, uh, when required, so it has solar power, it connect, creates hydrogen. But then you can run that same stack as a fuel cell and it can generate electricity. So the same device actually creates the hydrogen and then uses the hydrogen to create the electricity for the satellite. Uh, you know, plug power has lots of hidden technology that uh, you know, can be leveraged into commercial application is really one of our core strengths. Well, that's why I like you guys so much because you're, uh... You're not only good at what you do, but you're looking to the future and you're looking to, you know, make other things happen. And that, that's impressive. Yeah. And I know from your background <clears throat> in doing electrical engineering and stuff that um, you have that kind of mind that can put the uh, good design applications to good use. That makes sense. And um, I, I'm, I'm excited to see what Plug Power is doing. So that's why I like to keep checking in with you from time to time because I know it's always going to be enlightening for everyone. I'll give you one more application we're spending a good deal of time on, Stan. And that's actually, and this one you, your, your audience may not be aware of, is that uh, the power backup power data centers and even like distribution centers is becoming a big issue. So in the state of California, uh, I think many of your folks know about the grid issues they're having in California. The state has gone to large companies like Microsoft and Walmart and said, uh, you have to provide your own 96 hours of backup. Uh, but by the way, you can't use diesel. You know, I will, I'll, I'll contend for that level of backup because of the energy density of fuel cells versus battery. There's no other solution but hydrogen fuel cells. So what you're seeing is that uh, these companies are really beginning, you know, Microsoft, uh, there was National Hydrogen Day since we met on October 8th. And National Hydrogen Day, Microsoft, you know, presented three times during that week about the long term, they're looking to move fuel cells to replace all their diesel engines uh, at uh, data centers. And when you start looking at that potential market to replace all the Caterpillar generators and other generators, that's over a $36 billion annual opportunity. So there are large, large markets for uh, hydrogen fuel cells that solve problems people are demanding get solved. Well, that's, that's impressive too. And, and I know that it's a great, application for fuel cells, uh, power, uh, power backup, and uh, especially when you get to large scale and yeah. running a big 24 uh, seven distribution center uh, or data protections, you know, data center is uh, for, for 90 something hours, you know, for nearly a week, um, you're talking, you better have the reliability and I know the fuel cells can provide it, so. yeah. I tell you what, Andy, we blasted through 30 minutes here, and I really, <laughs> I really appreciate it. But we, we still got a lot more we could cover. So, do you mind if I invite you back sometime early next year? And we absolutely, Stan. It wouldn't be 2021 without being on your show. Okay, great. <laughs> Good to hear it. Well, I appreciate your time, Andy, and and uh, building you a fond aloha from the Aloha State. And uh, just remember, take a quick, uh, quick test, and you're out here in. in uh, no time. 90, it sounds good. I, you know, 
Thanks a lot, Stan. I look forward to being there in person. All right. Okay. Thanks, Take Eddie. Easy. Bye now. And to all the viewers, uh, see you next week on uh, Stan the Energy Man back at my regular time at three in the afternoon. Aloha.